In this episode, we are going to be talking about Stanley Kubrick's The Killing, which was released in 1956. This was his second film noir. And it's got a wonderful cast, just to name a few. It's got Sterling Hayden, Colleen Gray, Vince Edwards, and Marie Windsor. My guests today are from the Kubrick Universe podcast. They're both writers and contributor on this great podcast, Robert Castle and Mark Lentz. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for asking. Thanks, uh, Robert. No, my, my pleasure. As I was saying, I've, I've really been enjoying the podcast. And um, I, I was curious how you both uh, came to be interested in, in Kubrick to, to begin with. Well, I... In 1968, I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey, and I just saw it the same day as Planet of the Apes, <laughs> and got in, I guess the film never left me. I've been working on that film and writing about it for about 50 years, and my intellectual development sort of parallels my understanding or developing understanding of the film. And... From there, it was, but it wasn't until 1980s that I began my interest in Kubrick sort of crystallized into really trying to understand his films. And I think the first film I really dealt with was Full Metal Jacket. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine and I wrote an article, which was eventually published about 10 years later in Film Comment, dealing with uh, Full Metal Jacket. And there really was no looking back after that. I, after that, I wrote, especially in the 2000s, wrote a lot of articles on Kubrick's films, and 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 I have a, a small Kindle book of, uh, with six of those articles called "The Interpretive Odyssey of Stanley Kubrick," oh. which sort of gets at part of my, I guess, thesis about Kubrick's works, which may or may not come up in regard to the killing. Mark, what about you? I. Uh... The first Kubrick movie I loved was Dr. Strangelove, which I saw as a real little kid. And we happened to record it on a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And what I loved best, well, that was about, it was about the military. That's exciting to a little boy. And the music. I love the music. Right. And then when I was in college in the late 70s, there was, I had the good fortune that there was a course being taught on Kubrick. I could understand how each film built on the last one right. until by the time it got to 2001, my mind was just blown. Uh, and since then, I guess I've just been a super fan. When The Shining came out in 1980, I saw it 12 times before it left the theaters. Uh, and then my interest, because he didn't make many movies after that, uh, my interest was revived by this movie called Room 237. Oh, right. Which alerted me to the fact that there was other Kubrick nuts out there. <laughs> and so I happened to be in a meetup book club and I thought, well, I'll make a Kubrick meetup. And I did that for a couple of years. And through that, I discovered the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society on Facebook. And got in with the uh, admins there to the point where now I'm an admin. And one of the ideas we came up with was to have a podcast. And that podcast has been going on for five years now. And it's kind of developed into a great treasury of interviews. You know, from the beginning, uh, uh, we were saying a lot of these people are getting really old and we need to talk to them before they... <laughs> right. Yeah, son. And sure enough, I think our first interview was with Shane Rimmer, who was uh, the co-pilot in Dr. Strangelove. Ah. And he told us a lot of good stories. Uh, yeah, so that's my background. And oh, so most recently, since the pandemic, we've been doing a weekly Kubrick Zoom, where we just talk about all things Kubrick. And Robert and I are regulars, of course, on that. So... 
That's that's great. How is it uh, easy to to get a lot of the guests? Because you've got you've gotten so many people who have worked with him, Leon Vitelli, and and I mean it's it's quite incredible. I mean, was it easy to reach out and get them, or is it a bit of uh, follow ups? Uh... <laughs> uh, many. Uh, the thing is, everybody who worked on most everybody who worked on a Kubrick film, who was like the highlight of their career, right? And they love. They did their best work and they kind of feel obliged if somebody asks them to talk about Kubrick. Oh, great. They're willing to do it because they loved, they loved the thing that they were part of. So in general, uh, it's not hard to get people to say yes. That's good to yeah no that that that's that's good to know because I was really uh, impressed with the lineup. Um, this so this of course is Kubrick's second noir. Of course, the other noir he made was uh, Killer's Kiss. Um, this is just such an extraordinary film that I've always really really loved. Um, you know, film noir in general. I always ask guests when they come on the first time and we're we're doing a film noir what film noir means to, to them, because people have such a broad definition of what's noir and what's not. So uh, what do you, Robert, uh, to you, what, what does a film noir mean? I think, well, I taught a, a couple courses, night courses on film noir. And, and I, I think fate comes in heavily. In fact, I show a film noir. The first film noir I show in the, in this course is actually pre Maltese Falcon. Uh, it's called "You Only Live Once." To me, that's the essence. I think of film noir. The 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 your one is doomed. Plus, right. mistakes are made. I mean, that's one. That's not the only element, but uh, and then you have 1944 with "Murder My Sweet," uh, Laura. And um, woman in the window, yeah, and double indemnity. You know, again, in all those films, the, I think Murder My Sweet probably not as much, but what you have is the doomed couple, or this sort of uh, spiral that you know chews people up. You know, but, but as time goes on, I, and I, I'll mention this when we get into the killing. I think the further you get away from the depression of World War II, the, the sort of darkness or the, um, the elements of the early film noir begin to fade. And I think it's a natural thing. Uh, that's why later film noir is a little different. It, and we'll get into that when we deal, deal with the killing. What about you, uh, Mark? What is film noir to you? Well, I like film noir films. Uh, and I like what Robert just said about fate. I think that's why I like them. Uh, and definitely The Killing and uh, Killer's Kiss is film before that or film noir. But with Kubrick, I don't usually think, I think of them as Kubrick films rather than yeah. noir films. And that's because uh, for me, looking at something through the filter of a genre, my mind doesn't work that way. Right. So I, I don't come up with much reward for doing that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because this this film, uh, to me, certainly has like the classic noir elements. Like, of course, we have uh, a femme fatale, Marie Windsor. And of course, she's someone who is totally after money and uses, you know, sex in order to do so. And, you know, that that's such a classic a classic noir um and you know you're not really sure whether these guys are necessarily doomed uh i think the style certainly the the feeling of it the photography uh in terms of the dark shadows and and constantly using those lamps uh to like that are right in the shot and lighting the people's face it feels like everybody's being interrogated all the time uh just because of that 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 lamp right on their face uh, which I which I really really love, but I, I agree in the sense that it, it's that's certainly not a, a classic noir because uh, it's it's just like a Kubrick heist film, you know. But um, it certainly has fallen under the category of noir by many historians and uh, many noir lists over the years. So I'm curious uh, for each of you, 
you know, when you first saw this, how did you feel about it? And has your change, has your feelings changed about it with, with uh, repeat viewings over the years? Well, I've sort of, I liked it immediately. I forget, I forget when I first watched it, but it's, it's grown into my favorite Kubrick film. Mark has also mentioned that to me a lot. Uh, because he's surprised, I, 2001 is the most important film, uh, but The Killing is my favorite. I, I have to admit, I've watched it three times already this year, uh, and it, it's a pleasurable watch. It, yeah. it's, I, I sort of call it a prose poem, and there's a couple of films like this uh, out there, uh, but th it's the movement, the music, um, and even the way it's edit it you know with the non-chronological I, I love that what would you what about you mark has your feelings changed at all about this uh, over the years with repeat viewings yeah so i wanted to mention the way i did first learn of robert is i was listening to movie geeks united by oh Jamie yeah Duval. that's a great podcast too and he interviewed robert oh and wow robert said the killing was his favorite uh, Kubrick movie and I thought that was an audacious choice when you yeah. have all these others so that did impress me I first saw it so our teacher in college and our teacher showed us uh, the killing and the asphalt jungle back mm. to back as yeah. a comparison both yeah. have Sterling Hayden they're, yeah, they're definitely similar and at the time I thought the asphalt jungle was better because it fit in with my conception of what a movie should be with the stars that were in it and how, I don't know, how it fit the rules of the genre. It fit what I was expecting. And The Killing didn't always fit, fit, was, fit what I was expecting. And parts of it are a little bit grotesque and unsettling, which bothered me at that age. But over the many years since, I've come to enjoy it greatly. Recently, I, I was just impressed about the technique mm. that it uses. It's so compared, and especially compared to Asphalt Jungle, uh, the cinematographer for that one is just doing the typical things you do in any movie, but the cinematography and editing and music of The Killing are quite original, I think. So yeah, now I rate it as highly I also like to say whatever Kubrick movie I saw last, that's my favorite Kubrick movie. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I I always, I liked it at first as well, but when I've, I've seen it maybe two or three times, but this last time I thought, I I am, I am you know, I'm, I'm sort of where Robert's at. It's almost perhaps my favorite of his as well. Uh, I just think it's, uh, it, it was just, it was just so well done. Kubrick plays with genres and whether film noir is a genre or style, it seems to me, if he's not playing with it, he's sort of in tune with the evolution of film noir as film noir sort of dissipates, I guess, a little, or is, is I don't want to say less sincere, but, uh, you know, it's it's typical of the later noirs to a great extent. They're mm -hmm. a little more abstract. They're a little less um, have to do with people reacting, you know, out of um, to World War II, for instance. Uh, a lot of the criminals in World War uh, from the early noir seem to be almost uh, PTSD victims of World War II who right. find meaning in becoming hired guns, for, for instance. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I, I think in Neville Brand's character in uh, uh, DOA is sort of the highlight of that, but there's others. Well, so that's, that's how I see the major difference. Uh, right. You know. That's what's so fascinating about these characters is that they're not no, with the exception of Hayden, no one is actually a criminal. Like they all have regular jobs and they're all in a situation where they're desperate. You know, like the, 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 the guy who's a police officer uh, has all these uh, debts he has to pay off. Uh, Elijah Cook Jr. is, you know, his wife is on the outs with him and he feels that he has to basically buy her love. So he's desperate for money. Um, and I even really like... Uh, who played uh, Marvin Unger, J.C. Flippin, 
who is probably the most ambiguous character because you're not really sure why he wants to do this other than uh, this that scene he has with Hayden where he, he feels as though Hayden has become a son to him. And I thought maybe for him, it was more of an emotional reason to get involved in this or uh, some kind of thrill that he wants to be a part of because it's lacking from his life. I mean, you, you know so little uh, about him, which I, I really, really, I really, really enjoyed. Um, but I, that's what human, everybody's so hum, human, everyone, you, you empathize with everyone. It's just the power of the, uh, of cinema in general is that make you empathize with people who are doing something wrong, uh, who are, who are stealing, who are basically entering into crime. And even in that, you know, the, I mean, I'm all spoilers here. There's, there's no, we don't have to hide what happens in a film, but of course, as we know, in the end with that, that great shot where the, the, the money just blows in, <laughs> into the wind um, and it's gone and Hayden gets arrested. I mean, I, I feel for him. I, I mean, I, I, it works to such an effect that you really truly feel for these men, even, and they all die and they all, they all, you know, or, or in Hayden's case, he gets caught. So I'm curious if that's also been your experience. Do you find you really empathize with these guys? If I think of all the noirs, there is something working where you're, you know, to some, you're not rooting, for instance, in Double Indemnity for Fred McMurray and, right. to get um, caught. But as it turns out, they're, they're unwinding as things go on. And same with the asphalt jungle. You know, you're, you're, you're I think it's because you're inside the crime, so to speak. You're, you know, you're not looking at it from society's point of view. Uh, you know, these people aren't good, you know, for society. Right. Uh, but, you know, it is a movie and it's, there's something about identifying with the criminals in this. Uh, I mean, Kubrick sort of alludes to it. I think uh, more recent, it talks about the gangster and the artist. The society wants to see each of them fall. I'm not, mm. I'm not sure. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm not so sure about the gangster part, at least in movies. <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, why do we have the Godfather films? Uh, you know, it's not like you're watching them to see them be captured, be brought before the Senate committee. Right, right. Uh, so, and I think Kubrick was aware of this. I mean, I don't know how much you can make out of it, but um, he's definitely uh, knows where the audience's bread is buttered in this, I think. Yeah, absolutely. What, what about you, Mark? Has that been your experience as well with really empathizing with these men? Yeah, well, as you, as we talk about it, I am thinking that in almost every noir, including Double Indemnity, I tend to identify with the lead actor because they're usually charismatic, handsome. You understand they just want to do this one thing to get their lives right. Mm -hmm. And Sterling Hayden in this film Seems like a good, just like uh, uh, J.C. Flippin's character describes him. He just had some bad breaks. Yes. Uh, he doesn't want anyone to get hurt uh, in the movie. Unlike in the book, he just threatens Marie Windsor's character. Uh, so, yeah, you do. That's for me, the emotional. That's why it pulls me along emotionally, because I'm wanting I am kind of half wanting him to succeed or at least get away. Right. Yeah, that, that, that's always surprised me with Marie Windsor, like when she shows up and she's spying on them. Uh, I, I, you know, I thought he was going to kill her or kill Elijah Wood. And he's just like, look, just look, there's going to be plenty of money later. Uh, just mind your own business. <laughs> and that was yes. quite a, a, a risk. I mean, obviously, he, you know, it's such a what's so interesting about this heist is that the plan is so perfect, but he just made a couple of mistakes, which was to have let her go because then of course she told Vince Edwards about it and, and she's having an affair with him and they plot to steal the money afterwards, which is unfortunately why all these guys uh, get killed in that shootout. And at the end, you know, on that plane, um, I, you know, he just, I, I, I suppose, didn't think that a luggage that large would be, he just thought that wouldn't be a problem, <laughs> but that, that is a, a, a massive luggage, you know, uh, to bring on as a carry-on bag. <laughs> you know? well, when Johnny Clay is thinking on his feet here, he needs 
Alicia Cook Jr. to let him in to get to the um, what do you call it? the room with the money? Well, that's true. Yeah, so and, he was. And in I think I mean even necessary. I think he discusses that with Sherry uh, afterward how important he is to the plan. That's true. And he sort of wants to pull. I, now he's thinking about pulling out, and she's trying to get him back in. Yes. Uh, you know, that that's a that's a, I think a great scene because yeah. All of a sudden he. And he probably, you know, he was offended. This past week, we had Jan Harlan on our Zoom, and he mentioned uh, how jealousy was an important theme for Kubrick. It was an important thing, and, and, and eyes wide shut. Ah, uh, yes, that's a culmination. good point. So I touched earlier on these these use of lamps in in the scene which I love because it get, for me, it gave the feeling of, again, being in the spotlight or being under the, being interrogated in the police room, so to speak. Has, has uh, anyone ever discussed why he did that? Or, or was that the intention behind it? Sort of they're all under the, under the spotlight, so to speak? The first time I saw it mentioned was in a book by Michel Simant in the eighties, where he, sort of vi and, and visually sort of discusses Cooper films. And I think he has at least partly deals with the lighting and the intensity of the lighting. Uh, it is sort of startling though. Yes. Yeah. What, how do you feel about that, Mark? I actually noticed that kind of uh, those lamps more when I was watching it without sound and Kubrick was very keen on having practical lighting, meaning right. the lighting come from source observable sources on the set. Yes, he which he did, of like course, in Barry Lyndon later with the candlelight. Yes. So I think this was his trying to work out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't think it's as quite as good as later on, although I guess it fits right in with the noir yes. dramatic lighting. Yes. Principles. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it, it's very expressionistic. Um, I, I thought that was, you know, really, really inventive. Uh, just looking at the performances, I mean, clearly Kubrick liked noir movies, you know, because a lot of these actors were in uh, so many noir films. I mean, Alicia, Alicia Cook Jr., who really, I, I think, is an underrated actor. I mean, it, just his eyes alone speak volumes. I mean, it's amazing how much he as you touched on Robert with his jealousy uh, over, over, you know, what his wife may be up to uh, cheating on him. Uh, just the fear that he elicits uh, in his eyes is extraordinary. Um, and then of course, um, I love this Colleen Gray because she's so, and as she was in some other film North, but she's so angelic. She seems like someone who would not be involved with a guy like Sterling Hayden, but I, I it's sort of perfect casting because it makes you, it makes you want him to get away with it even more just for this woman, you know, <laughs> just so they can start afresh and, 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 you know, stop stealing, you know, and that, that, that that's a very, you know, uh, classic heist convention where the, the person is, this is their last job and the last, and they're not going to do it again. Um, I'm curious, what are the standout performances from both of you in this one? Timothy Carey stands out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Mass, He's so he great. Is, and, 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 there's a lot, I think, written about his um, sort of testiness as an actor. He was a total pain in the ass. Uh, you know, and he, and he fits in perfectly here to give a, you know, this sort of psychotic assassin who's, mm -hmm. you know, ha handling a puppy as they're discussing the uh, <laughs> job, you know. Uh, I mean, his presence in Paths of Glory is somewhat different, but uh, in that yeah. movie, Kubrick. But in that movie, Kubrick didn't bother with French accents or anything, right? Uh, and, and so it sort of legitimized, and, and his character sort of works out well there. But he he is definitely a standout, just as a you know this guy who's uh, totally you know, sort of independent, I think, of uh, people telling them what to do. 
Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was so, he was so unique. I mean, he just, just everything down to the way he looked, the way he talked. Um, he, I don't, I've never seen anyone like him, you know, like he was, he just has a vulnerability, but yet like he looks crazy, <laughs> like he looks yeah. murderous and he's so perfect for these kinds of parts. And I love the scene that he has uh, at the racetrack in the parking lot with James Edwards, who, you know, he may, he makes him feel that, that he's like trying to befriend him and James Edwards appreciates it. And then, you know, he, he, he approaches him perhaps one too many times. And then of course he's so terrible and awful and racist towards him. Uh, and I love that once he gets killed, the shoehorn that, that James Edwards gave him uh, is then, sorry, that wasn't a shoehorn. What do you call that? A horseshoe. A horseshoe. horseshoe. Sorry. I was all, I, I got my, <laughs> I got my shoes uh, uh, mixed up. Uh, the horseshoe. I love that that good luck charm. The irony of that. Just now he's dead, and it's on. You know, it's under the tire, under the car. Uh, that was so so great. Yeah, he, he he really is extraordinary. It's too bad that he's he was so difficult, and his stories are like legendary. On um, you know, one eyed Jacks, and uh, he worked with Cassavetes a couple of times, uh, killing him a Chinese bookie, and many of Moskowitz, and. Um, he's but he's really something else what about you mark is there some actors in this that you uh stand up performances that you are quite memorable for you marie windsor yeah she was uh, great she yeah again when i was in college i reacted to these things viscerally so I, since i didn't like her character i thought she's so nasty yeah i didn't like her but now i can separate the two and boy is she so good with her delivery she, she was great uh, yeah just yeah. just down to the those scenes again with Elijah Cook Jr. I thought were so just to see his paranoia and jealousy build and she knows exactly what she's doing and that's exactly what what she wants uh, in order to you know get him to do the job particularly because he's beginning to want to pull out of it um, and I just thought that she was perhaps one of the most interesting femme fatales I've I've seen um, I really liked her. Uh, I really liked her a lot. There's that really beautiful um, POV shot that he did once all the guys are, are, are killed uh, in that shootout later on. And I, I just read this morning that apparently the DOP did not even want to do that because, you know, they were going to have to use handheld and it was a bit shaky as it was Elijah Cook Jr.'s POV to go to the door and leave. Um, and, you know, that cinematographer is obviously extremely old fashioned. And I just thought that's one of the greatest shots because at first I'm not quite sure who got shot and it's a little fuzzy and again, you know, cause Elijah Cook Jr. It's from his POV and what he's experiencing, but that was such a almost scary thing that suddenly these guys who had all this money are now boom, gone. Um, I'm curious if there's other, you know, trivia on the making of this film that, interested you both the most because the most because i know that this uh there was a lot of issues with ua and putting it out of order and is there anything that uh you've read over the years that stand out to you well since you mentioned lucian ballard the cinematographer right uh, i had not heard that story before and uh but it makes sense and one of the things about Kubrick is he had made his own film fulfilling every role. Right. He had this background as a still photographer and he had shot a lot of hand hilt held in his uh, documentaries that he did before features. So it was nothing to him to yes. use a hand held. And actually uh, there's actually like three stories about Lucian Ballard. The second is, and Lucian Ballard was a great cinematographer, but he was just, he did things the Hollywood way. Yeah, yeah. And they sent yeah. him up to where the racetrack was to get some second unit shots. And they came back very boring. And Stanley felt they wouldn't add anything to the film. So he sent his friend, Alexander Singer, up there. And Singer did a lot of things to get good handheld shots where you're right in the action. And the last thing he did, and I don't know if it made it into the movie, he knew it was going to be the last thing he did, is he got out on the racetrack and lay down in front of the starting gate with his handheld camera so he could get all the horses coming <laughs> oh towards God. him. 
The maverick <laughs> filmmakers, was, I love it. <laughs> he was dragged away by security. One thing that interested me, I ended up reading the book, Clean mm. Break. Oh yes, yeah. And and it, it's it's interesting to see some of the changes made, uh, uh, you know, regarding, and, and, you know, the major one was the non-chronological order. Right. Um, but, you know, there's some things that are similar, dire direct dialogue, and some not, but it's, but if you look at Kubrick's films in general, this, he mostly took uh, after, and this was the first film he used another source, most of his films, if not all, were all from novels. Yes. And um, like probably the one movie that wouldn't have been would be Napoleon, right. where he did like a year and a half of research. I don't think he was going to base that on any particular work, but it's an interesting thing to look through Kubrick's work and see how he uh, adapted the films or had with his screenwriters. I was looking up the Internet Movie Database. I think one of the last things in the trivia had to do with apparently they were thinking of having Johnny Clay run after the money. Oh. <laughs> and he was going yeah. to be chopped up <laughs> oh, by a God. propeller. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, now you know, in, in, you know, cinematically, it, it's sort of if you see his body floating around with the money, it would have been uh, <laughs> interesting. But I think it turned out to be a little too difficult or oh yeah, yeah. I think he uh in fact, it might have been the cinematographer said, but yeah, we just can't do this, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, it's, and also, it, when you see at the end how it ends. I, I love that. He's, he's powerless. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, exactly. He's yeah, um, he doesn't even try to run, you know? They, then, of course, he, his bad luck continues. There's no cabs. <laughs> and I love, again, that POV shot of those two cops just walking towards him right. slowly is, uh, <clears throat> you know, really, really, really wonderful. It really is an extraordinary film, and I, I think it's it's obviously influenced the heist film in general so much. I mean, you look at, I mean, I think the most popular example is Reservoir Dogs, uh, Tarantino's film. I mean, I think the, the killing to me is much more interesting because the characters you 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 really you really feel for these guys. They're more humanized, and with 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 Tarantino's, they're a little too cool for school. I mean, I'm not really a big fan of his movies to begin with <laughs> and i've said that before on this channel and some people don't like that i say that but um you can certainly see the influence on his film and and just so many heist films particularly the elements of you know hey it's 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 the last job you know you saw that in so many films uh, to come thanks so much for for coming i really appreciate that you took the time to come and talk about uh no, Kubrick meets noir, so to speak, and night <laughs> and the killing, nineteen fifty six. And where's the best place to to listen to the podcast? It's pretty much on all of the various platforms, right? Apple and Spotify, and just I've, type in Kubrick's universe, and yeah, you'll find it all the platforms. Great. Oh, and please, uh, Stephen Rigg is the producer of it, and yeah, sadly he couldn't be here for this uh, interview, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. You'll find material there that it's you'll great. find nowhere else. Oh, for sure. And if you're a, a Kubrick fan, it's uh it's you know, you're it's like a candy store. It's just every so many people he worked with. Uh it's really, really, really great. And uh where can uh people find uh both of you on online? Because I know that you know, Robert, you mentioned you're a writer. Are, are you both uh have uh so on social media and have work online? I have a Amazon site i have about 15 books or so s several about seven or eight six five or six are kindle okay great hard copies some are self-published some are a uh, small publisher I, i'm i write uh, novels so mostly uh, novels fiction and i have a uh, i'm not sure how readily i have a thing called my our daily film where I, instead of a blog i have about 70 articles or more on that i'm i'm not sure i i know i've referenced the some of the articles in the imdb for certain films and bright lights film journal has sort of the body of my a large body of my uh, film work so all you have to do is go to the archive and authors and you'll find 
And it's you know, more than Kubrick. Uh, I have a fair amount on Hitchcock. Right. Uh, and media and media movies tend to be my sort of interest, uh, like things like King of Comedy mm. and The Truman Show movie. is yeah. becoming a major element in my life. Great. Well, I'll I'll leave the the link. Uh, send send me the links, and I'll put them in the description box if people want to okay. uh, read the, you know, the writings of Rob, of Robert Castle and Mark. Uh, how about you? Anything people can find online? Yeah, I have two plugs. I'll send you the links. Uh, okay. Please please join the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society on Facebook. Uh, there is a lot of interesting people. Uh, on there and a lot of good posts. I'm an admin on that site. And then we'd really love it if you would join me and Robert on our weekly Zooms about Kubrick. And you can find them by searching on Stanley Kubrick Meetup NYC. Oh. And uh, I'll send you the main link for that. Okay, Yeah, great. we're always looking for new regulars. Yes. Yeah, no, Kubrick. absolutely. Yeah, please do. And I'll leave the links uh, in the description box below. And for those of you uh, watching on YouTube, this, this uh, YouTube channel, there's also an audio version podcast. Uh, it's on all of the various platforms. If you just Google Robert Bellissimo at the movies, but there's much more on the YouTube channel. So if you're listening to this now, go over to the YouTube channel if you want to watch and or listen to more. And if this is your first time on the YouTube channel, please consider subscribing by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You'll see it floating above my head here to your top left. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release a new video or when I go live. Gentlemen, thanks again. Please come again uh, to do more Kubrick or anything else because uh, I know you're big film buffs in general. So thanks again, guys. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk soon.